Hello from Blue Willow Bookshop in Houston, Texas. I am Kathy Berner, the event coordinator at the shop. My colleagues and I are honored to host this virtual event celebrating the publication of Alexis Hall's novel, Waiting for the Flood, which also contains the companion story, Chasing the Light, and the epilogue, Aftermath. Thank you so much to our partners at Sourcebooks Casablanca, for working with us on this event. This is our eighth collaboration with Alexis and his team, and we are honored to get to work with all of them to deliver books and events to all of you. So let's welcome Alexis to the conversation. Hello. 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 Should we carry on talking about cheese? <laughs> yes, let's keep talking about cheese. That was the green room conversation, friends, was cheese. Um, it's so nice to hear your voice. It's so nice to have this book out in the world. Um, your author's note that I hope everybody reads when they get their copy of the book is um, so lovely. And to know that you've completed something that you have intended to complete for over a decade is a really beautiful thing. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It is. Um, so I'm going to dive right in. Okay, first of all, I have to do my show and tell. I have a note. Show and tell. Nails? Mm -hmm. Boom! Match the stickers? Hey. I am drinking from two mugs today. Oh, one is, of course, my evergreen Oliver and Luke. Uh -huh. And one, here's a new one for y'all, because it's purple. I got Prince. Oh, very cool. As a Minnesota I, native, my daughter gave that to me for Christmas. Uh, are you aware what the Australian term for drinking out of two drinking vessels simultaneously is? It's a double-handed. It's double fisting. fisting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, yeah. anyway. <laughs> yes, I do. That's an American term, too. Um... <laughs> So that was my show and tell. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about, because it's been on your stories and on his stories, Will Watt. Oh, no, so good. So, so, so good. Um, he just, he delivers so well, and he's, it's so charming. And having experienced 10 things with him, and now experiencing Blood, Light, and Aftermath with him, mm -hmm. his uh range is incredible mm -hmm. no he's great it's such a joke so would you ever consider doing your own audiobooks oh gosh absolutely not no i'm not a voice actor um like i <laughs> i like it's one of those things where like, I, I i'm a big believer in, in division of labor like um i there are there are some books there are some types of book that i think can be done by the author um but i don't think novels are one of them like um a novel it, uh, like <sighs> reading the audiobook of a novel is an act of performance and i am not a performing artist i am a written written word artist um so no i i it's a, it's if nothing else like um like i like i could do like three accents um and one of those is my natural accent uh, so like it would it would it would come across incredibly badly when when you're when you and your team are considering voice artists, how many do you typically, how many do you typically listen to when you're making a choice? It's it varies hugely. It depends on it uh, depends on who who's who's the other end of the team, as it were. Because obviously it's uh, in, in, in like like publishing is quite a heterogeneous industry, so. Um, it will depend on how closely the publisher works with the the the, the voice book people uh, audiobook people audiobook that's the word um and how much they communicate with me um so it can it can range from like one to like kind of you know three to four depending okay. um okay. Uh, and, 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 it, and it'll depend and sometimes it'll be like kind of i'll get a list of names and i'll listen to like kind of whatever samples they have freely available and then you'll get auditions from a short list of them and then you pick from them or sometimes they'll just create a complete fate complete it, like, genuinely it runs the gamut Okay. Okay. Um, turning towards the book itself, with the publication of Light and Aftermath in addition mm -hmm. to Flood, um, you've given us perspectives and nuance and so much to consider. The list of rabbit holes I went down <laughs> when I read this trio of stories was just an absolute delight. So thank you so much for that. I the really got to go on an Yes. Well, I, yes, I did. Briefly, um, you realize it would actually suck. Basically. 
Yeah, it sounds really charming. Yeah. <laughs> but then it doesn't. Yeah, no, I, I am nowhere near organized enough. I, I would be terrible on it, but... Yeah, and you'd have to have so few possessions. Yeah, with you. no, exactly. Yeah. Which would maybe be freeing. Yeah. And probably a good exercise. But also, I kind of like my shit. Like... <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, what am I going to do with all of this? Exactly. Yeah. No, you don't. Hang around the outside. Exactly. Exactly. All my all my um, Briarwick candles can hang outside. Yeah, exactly. They'll be they'll be ballast. Um, yeah. But I just I loved it. So moving on to that, one of the great gifts in this book was the incredible sense of place. Oh, thank you. When before you even wrote Flood. And you were in Oxford. I'm assuming you were in Oxford before you wrote Blood. Yeah. Did you see? Did you see the book settings and the characters moving around as you moved around the area? Oh, that's a complex one. I mean, I don't think like so. Obviously, I have. Obviously, I have spent quite a lot of time in Oxford, and um, I, I don't, I don't kind of deliberately walk around cities being like this would be good for this specific book but i think i kind of one absorbs things and like if you spend if you spend any amount of time in a city on a flood plane like you will you will hit a flood at some point and so it's like it wasn't a conscious like kind of i'm gonna write a book about a flood i'm gonna go somewhere that floods kind of thing it was um it's almost like you have a Oh God! If I say Rolodex, that is a really eighties. Well, I know 80s what you're talking about. Analogy. Um, I have a mental spreadsheet, a, a, a mental my documents folder. I suppose it would be now. Um, and then you just you see something and you're like, and, and you, you 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 feel a feel some kind of way about it. And you're like, ah, oh, and you just file that away for later. Um, if you are the kind of person that perpetually turns things into works of fiction, um, which you know is literally my job. Um, so it's about just kind of absorbing those kind of images and those kind of and that kind of sense of place. And when I, I like, I do like to experience places when I go there. If you see what I mean, like I it's do. like it's nice to kind of and, and you know kind of a, just sort of a slightly slightly absorby way. It's nice to take a moment, just get a sense of the atmosphere, sense of what's going on. Just look around you, like you know, look up occasionally is um uh, is nice because when everyone forgets to look up. Absolutely, um, and to be present and to absorb it exactly, um, yeah. which is, uh, is is something I'm not always great at, but try to do partly for professional reasons, partly because it's just nice to be in the moment sometimes, and to you know be walking along and just be like, you know, well, this is like, um, you know, this is like this, this is a thing. This is a this is a moment I am inhabiting in a space, in a a point in space time, as it were, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in my light cone. If I want to be, you know sciencey about it yeah. relativistic um yeah i mean i and knowing that you do that yeah enhances and explains so much about what makes your work so oh, to thank me, you. extraordinary to me before i forget and i forgot to mention it in the housekeeping we are gonna we are gonna do a spoilery conversation near the end of this so if there are any spoilery questions i'm not going to ask them now i will be very clear when we move to the spoiler zone so if you want to turn if you want to leave at that point, don't worry about it. Um, sorry for that digression. That's okay. um, another one of the rabbit holes I went down. Game theory. Oh, yeah. Tragedy of the Commons, Pirates, Valuing Access to Spoons. Yeah. Which that National one is yeah. fascinating, not only having worked in an office, but also being mm -hmm. a member of a family. Yeah. And you find utensils all over your home. Mm -hmm. um, so here's a question. For you if you are playing a game for the second time do you ever propose a rules change based on perceived inefficiencies or fairness that you discover the first time you play the game second time no um so if you look about like actually so um so i'm i'm a big believer in so first of all the kind of games i play you have to play about three or four times just to play the rules right um in terms of, and obviously, nothing else says obviously, game theory is not hugely about that kind. No, of No, I split. I, I diverted yeah. from game theory. No, 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 no of course, yeah, but it's um, uh, like, I I do move in circles. But I have a big house rule culture. Okay. Um. So often there will be kind of accepted 
accepted diversions from, from uh, what what uh, the cool kids call raw or rules as written, um, either for fairness or for like just what makes sense or just to, to speed things up. But I'm a big believer in playing things as as close to as written at least once, just because I think that <sighs> otherwise you're tinkering with something without knowing how it works. Yep, fair. So I'm just giving you an example from my own circumstances. Mm -hmm. We play Carcassonne quite a bit. Oh, cool. um, and someone who also plays Carcassonne with me has decided in conversation with me, but he he's the one who likes to make, I like to play rules as written. He likes to yeah. play house rules. Yeah. Um, the farmer strategy is too valuable in his economist economist perspective. Yeah. So we have now had to place a ceiling on the number of farmer points you can get. Interesting. Yes. Um, without wishing to go too down the a rabbit hole or uh, indirectly insult your friend, um, there's, there's a um, there's have you heard of the concept of scrub mentality as it's described in fighting games? No. Uh, so um, now I I have not played Carcassonne in a very long time, so I because I tend to play mostly cooperative games these days. Um, um, so. In the fighting game community, like you, know, like Street Fighter Tech and that kind of thing, um, uh, there is the concept of a uh, there is the concept of a scrub. Um, actually, I think it really came from Super Smash Brothers, um, and it's often just used to mean new or bad player. But like the technical meaning is, it's someone who assumes that the reason, who, who assumes that a strategy that they often lose to or often or dislike is too strong, when actually they just need to learn to counter it and one of the things i would say is that like with um so it's possible your friend's just being a scrub um and some, sometimes yeah things are genuinely unbalanced sometimes you want to say well okay let's either implement a rule or let's um let's just yeah have a policy of not doing that thing but there are also times when it's like well actually i don't think it's too strong i just think you're not thinking of alternatives that is going to be an excellent point that I am going to raise next time we play. So I mean, you. if nothing else, look at the online Carcassonne community, see if it's felt to be a general thing. It might. Or yeah, might not no, be. and I can do that. But it was this was just something that came mm -hmm. up recently, and I was like, well, that kind of fits into yeah. this. Um, character I loved, Mrs. P. Ah, uh, yes. Also, eating cereal out of the packet. Uh huh. Yes, ma'am. She <laughs> is so great. I absolutely adore her. Ah, uh, um. And on the note of archives and conservation, you may, y'all may or may not know, I was a librarian before I became a bookseller. Oh, so cool. This totally spoke to me. I love the descriptions of the ephemera as medium that's interspersed throughout Flood, everything from the York mystery plays to mm -hmm. a recipe for elderflower wine. I, uh -huh. it, it just informed Edwin even more. Mm -hmm. I so high appreciation for that. Oh, On the note of ephemera, many of the items you reference in these books has have been has many items have been digitized. Is there anything you've seen in person that you've really loved? Oh, um, not so. Getting access to these things in person is actually quite faddly. Um, so I've not had that opportunity very much. Really, it's, it's, it involves going out, talking to people, doing things. It's um. So I've seen pictures, I've seen digitized copies of things, but I tend yeah. not to. Also, I tend to be a bit of a recluse, so I am. Um... Fair. So, yeah, if I can't do it from my desktop, uh, it's... um. Yeah, I will say, 15 years ago, we saw, we were in Los Angeles and went to the Getty and saw the Michelangelo sketches. And that oh, was I... something. That's pretty cool. That that was pretty cool. Um. All right, I'm bouncing around. So, Flood... The community brought about by natural disaster. You uh -huh. obviously have that experience in Oxford. Uh, mm -hmm. We certainly have it in Houston uh, with hurricanes, and people around the world have it with their own natural disasters. Yeah, it's a bit more intense with hurricanes than it is with like two inches of flooding. I, and I will say, you know, you tell the crocodile story with Edwin. Yeah. Um, after Hurricane Harvey, uh, there was a story in the local paper with mm -hmm. photographs. So this is not urban legend. Mm -hmm. um many homes unfortunately and disastrously flooded yeah of course feet. it was it was horrible when one family went back to their home they heard a noise in the dining room 
Yeah. And it was a seven foot alligator under the dining room table. Oh blimey! Where where was that? Was that right right near you? me? Do you do you have like local? Because I know they have alligators in Florida. Do you have them in? Oh no, we do. So my part of Houston backs up to uh, a park that was created to be a floodplain. And yeah. the problem with Harvey is that that floodplain overflowed, and yeah. they had to release water to flood houses. You know, yeah. In order to prevent many people's basements, which yeah. From flooding, they had to divert water yeah. that way, and they brought water from the park into homes. I mean, and the park's full of alligators. Yeah, yeah. and coyotes, yeah. and all kinds of other gorgeous, gorgeous wildlife. Yeah, but not in but, your house. Not in your house, no, not so much. Um, I also Edwin's stutter is handled so adroitly. And the way it informs his character and the way he claims it and also... Courtney, you are so coming to Houston. Yes, you are. I will make sure you don't see any alligators. <laughs> um, the Just way... don't swim in a lake. <laughs> um, the, uh... But the way Edwin claims that is remarkable. And I also love the way that Adam says, oh, that's annoying, rather than being rather mm -hmm. than pitying him. Yeah. And that made me think about one of my favorite picture books of all time, which is called uh -huh. I Talk Like a River by Jordan Scott and illustrated by Sydney Smith. And I know Caroline's going to throw the link in there just so everybody can take a look at it because oh, cool. it is a stunner of a picture book. And from a craftsman perspective, it's beautiful, but, and also from a story perspective, it's incredible. Oh. So just throwing that. Okay, Caroline, can you get ready to take over the screen and share my share what I have to share with everybody? She's gonna do it. So this is sort of spoilery, but I love Mr. Froderick. And one of the reasons I love Mr. Froderick so much, I'm waiting on Caroline, is that my family has their own Mr. Froderick oh. right there. Oh, that is that is my sister's Mr. Toad. Um he is on his second waistcoat. I don't know if you can see it in the photo, but he has masking tape over one of his eyes to hold it oh. on his head. He is on his second pair of shoes and his second set of gloves. He has got to be... He's more... He's almost 50 years old. And that there he is sitting on my sister's bed, and she sent me that a few months ago. So he still oh. exists. And we'll get into that when we go to spoilers. That would be cute. Um, let me see what else. Okay, I want to talk about the cover. The covers. Oh, no, dude, the covers are fantastic. Right? So there's Flood. And then there's Light. And then we have For Real. And we have Glitterland. Yep. And that image on your Instagram of all four of the covers together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, fantastic job. I, so, when you turn the work over to elizabeth do you give her art notes or does she just create it i mean so what will happen is i will i'll usually get like i feel like do you have any do you, do you have do you have requests kind of messages but for this series in particular actually it was very very heavily workshops um okay. so there were a huge number of like kind of but not not for not for waiting specifically because obviously the the style is the same across things but the, like when picking a style for the series like mm -hmm. um like the publisher went through a bunch of things and i i had some feedback and other people had some feedback but like with it it's something, I, it's something i'm very broken record on is i am not a visual artist i am not an expert on this I like to give people their head um their heads okay i suppose yeah um so i um very much like to let people um i very much like to let people do their jobs um and so i don't i never said yes what i want is for it to be half half a color in a kind of muted tone and half white and for like and all that and like, like that that's a visual art thing that um uh um that um uh, the the that um that's you know the, the job of the artist um i i think i was given the corners mentioned it in the um in the chat i think i did 
somewhat tongue in cheekily suggest that if we got the spines to make a rainbow, because I think it's going to wind up being seven in the end, um, that it would mean that people could do stacks of them in Pride, um, which would be you know, convenient free advertising. And it actually went with that, which is cool. Uh, well, and the palette, the like the specific palette that was chosen is just so rich and so vibrant and so gorgeous. Yeah, no, it's really, it's really well done. Like, I'm, I'm blown away by them. That super, super amazing. They are fantastic. Um, here's a few more questions. This one's from Tiger Lily. It's been a while since the Spires books were first released, and to Tiger Lily, Britain feels like a very different place. Oh gosh, yeah. Um, you, she says you've, or they've said you've always been incredibly deft at weaving so social or societal issues into your work without making them the focus. Are there any things you think you would have written differently or introduced if you were writing the books from scratch now? It's, it's sort of a complex one. So, so I'm like, I have a very, um, uh, as you might know, I'm going to be quite deprecating, self deprecating about my work. And I sort of, I simultaneously don't want to say, yes, I write searing books about social issues. Because, yeah, I, I write, I write, I write pleasurable texts. I write b books that are enjoyable to read, first and foremost. Um, but I also don't want to be one of those people being like, how oh, dare you bring politics into this thing that's clearly inherently political. Um, so yeah, like I, I do have an awareness of social issues, and I think what's I think what is really complex is uh, it's sort of two things. So like, I think Britain's changed quite a lot in some ways, and not at all in others. Like I think, and I uh, I don't want to speak too much to um uh, to you know uh, to, to to countries that aren't my own, but I think similarly with uh, I think with both like post Brexit Britain and post MAGA America. I think a lot of things that feel like they're changed, they've changed, are actually just things that like have maybe drawn attention to things that were there all along. Um, like, 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 yeah, I don't. It's not like Britain pre twenty fourteen wasn't a little bit parochial and xenophobic. Um, I. Obviously, there are some things, are particularly within the LGBT space, like like the focus has shifted quite a lot. Because obviously, like um, one of the things that's really depressing thinking about it is that like um, because like back when back in like you know 2012, 2013, um, like we were in quite a hopeful space. Like we were in, like 2014, a Tory government legalized same sex marriage. Um, now like a decade later and suddenly the whole world's coming for trans people um in this i uh, really what's deeply frustrating what, what's the most frustrating thing about this is like so, suddenly people are up in arms about something that's basically been the case for a decade like one of my favorite like flippant go-to points about the current like transphobic moral outrage is that um uh, uk law has recognized that women can have a penis for longer than it is recognized that women can have a wife and for like fully ten years longer as well, because like the gender recognition act was like two thousand four. Um, so there's definitely that. Um, so that the there are those issues in particular. Yeah, I'd be navigating very very differently because different things would be uppermost in my mind. I think part of it also, and there's a little bit a little bit more complicated, is that I think there are some things that I have. They obviously handled differently in my new books relative to my old books, not so much because of the way Britain has changed between 2014 and 2024, but because of the way Britain changed between like 1990 and 2000. Um, because so, uh, uh, an example I was thinking about with this was like, I'm so like a lot of what Pansies is about. Is that it's very much grounded in Fen and Alfie's experiences of growing up queer as they would have done as people who grew up queer and were then in their 20s in the early 2010s. Whereas obviously, um moving a decade later, the like literally the opening line of Ten Things That Never Happened is about how Sam got more shit for being named after Hobbit than he got for being gay. Because, like, that's it. the experiences that characters would have had in their formative years will have been different. And I think one of the things that's, like, kind of... One of the things I find a little bit complex when you talk about, like, quote-unquote, society changing is that, like, most... When you think about it, society is made up of the people in society. And because 
Like people don't drop dead at thirty, so the um uh so the the people who were in society ten years ago are still in society. People who, you know, it's it's just that people who grew up gay in the eighties and nineties and were in their twenties in the late twenty ten two thousands, early twenty tens are now in their thirties or forties. This, this yeah. still exists and their experiences still exist. And in some ways the society they grew up in is at least for them still present. And similarly, um like one of the things that's um uh one of the things that is complex about like I think when people talk about multiculturalism, um particularly because it's often used as like a, a right wing bet noir, um people often think about it in terms of like kind of your immigrant communities and things, but actually all large nation states are multicultural. Like there was actually a, there was a really interesting paper thing that I read like last year now about um how deep seated the cultural differences between the different original colonist groups in America are to this day. And you can, can genuinely trace back like differences between like the Deep South and Appalachia and like the bits that were settled by the Puritans. And a lot of modern cultural differences kind of still go back to whether your ancestors were like kind of you know, old world plantation aristocrats or old world Puritans. Um, and so, mm. like, when you talk about how society has moved on, like, actually, um, I, I, I mean, again, you can talk about how society, uh, yeah, but it, it, uh, like, I mean, funnily enough, I think Houston and New York are quite different these days. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and having yeah. lived in both places, yes. Yeah, yeah, um, and, and they and they kind of always have been, and so I I think it's always a bit difficult when you talk about kind of um, how society has changed. When actually, what often what you're talking about is how the bits of society you're in, the bits of society you're paying attention to. So like it's so like so so, so kind of um uh, so like so, so like if we talk about um trans issues, we talk about the fact that like there's this huge moral panic about trans people right now, and that is obviously a huge problem, and that was less prevalent. But at the same time, the British tabloid press have always been disgustingly transphobic because the British tabloid press is revolting. Um, so it's this kind of this complex thing where like kind of things go up and things go down. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I've rambled about this for fucking ages now. I'm really sorry. Um, it's interesting. I yeah. would tell you if it wasn't. Um, so I don't think there are. There's nothing I think I would have. So basically, there's no specific thing I look back and think of. Oh, I would have slanted that differently. We're writing about it today given the proviso that it was that I was writing the same book about the same people in the same year. But of course, I'm not writing about the same book about the same people in the same year. I'm writing about people who are living in the living in the 2020s and are in their 20s and therefore would have had different formative experiences, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I absolutely see what you mean. And thank you for that. That When you go down a deep rabbit hole with us, it is always fascinating. Thank you. Um, here's one from Michelle that's a little lighter. Uh, mm -hmm. Ten Things and Chasing the Light both feature the Christmas holidays. Do you enjoy writing about holidays, or is that simply a coincidence? Uh, it's it's a coincidence. Uh, it's it's um I think part of it is actually so talking about the the wandering around. The, the, remember the sense of place thing we were talking about. Yes. I think part of it is I'm just an incredibly impressionable person. Like um so pretty much like to some extent. All of my books, or not all of my books, some of them are set at specific times for specific reasons, but quite a lot of my books are kind of quite strongly set in the time of year I started writing them. So, like, I started writing something fabulous in kind of late spring, early summer. It's a very late spring, early summer. Oh, book. it so is. Um, so, um, uh, not always like, um, no, but like, um, uh, so 10 things because it's sort of an homage to while you were sleeping, that was consciously a Christmas book, but then. I started work on um, chasing kind of directly after that. So, and that would have been like kind of around about the a little bit towards the end of the holiday period. Um, so I very much had that headspace on and it was very wintry. And of course there's this, without wishing to be too RDSC, there's obviously all the water imagery and waiting and then there's all of the ice imagery and chasing. Um, and that's, kind of part of it so it's not it's kind of a combination of coincidence and like 
one of them having a specific reason and one of them having a like a reason for a wintry vibe and unless you live in narnia mm -hmm. or australia then like kind of you can't really have a wintry vibe without there being at least some christmasiness yeah um yeah that answer just made me go off on another digression in my brain. And that is that we have the great gift of your books being, I consume your books in a number of ways. One, mm -hmm. I the first time through, I read them at breakneck speed because mm -hmm. I have to see what's happening. I have to see what you're doing. I go through again. I tab the bejesus out of it <laughs> um, and I'm thoughtful about it. And I see all mm. these things and I go down rabbit holes and I digress along with you. And then I listen to the audio. Mm -hmm. So what a gift that you have given us by creating stories that can be consumed in so many different ways. Right. And I can, cons like a reader can consume it in all three ways or in any one of the ways. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. So thank you. I just, I love it. Um, before I turn to um, the Q&A and then move to spoilers, here's one from someone we might know named Mary. Um, out of all of your books, which ones would Edwin read? Oh, good Lord. Um, so one of the things I would say is that I, I tend not to write the sorts of people that read my books uh which i, I don't mean a, like a i or rather it's um i have a sort of slight kind of um a thing in my head about genre writers writing about genre writers because it often feels either a little bit self-aggrandizing or a little bit like you are trying to st stealth market your mates um okay like i think so, if, so, so obviously, Edwin is quite, quite, quite I, I, obviously a lot of Edwin's book-related work is his, you know, work in conservation things, his work, on, his work on ephemera. Um, I don't think he's necessarily the kind of person that would be a massive Alexis Hall fan. Like, I think he might, ch he might check out one of the more popular ones, but um, he's not. I don't think I doesn't think he's a super big genre reader. Thoughts on Artie? Do you think Artie's a genre reader? Uh, so, so Artie, I, I think Artie's one of those like um, uh, one of those not exactly uh, one of those almost ironic genre readers. So, like he reads um, uh, Georgia Hay. Uh, I think he would read. I think he'd definitely read like really classic old school romances with like clinch covers, um, and um, uh. Like, so I think ironically, like, I don't think he's narcissistic enough to read his own book, but I think the, I think the like kind of the quirky title photographic cover style of um, uh, book that he's in, ironically, actually might be the kind of book he'd, he'd, yes. he'd, he'd, he'd take a look at. So I'm just, I have to pull myself away from mentally going down another rabbit hole because I want to be present with you, but like. I'm now thinking of what book would I hand sell to each one of your characters if they happen <laughs> to walk into the store? That is something for another time. I'm not doing it oh, right now, cute. but what a joyous exercise that will be. Yeah, put it in the comments. Um, put it in the um, uh, in the description when you do the upload, upload for YouTube. I will do that. Um, okay, I'm moving. Hang on. This computer is not being my friend. So I'm moving to a couple sec questions from the Q&A. Um, here's one from Light Snack that made me laugh, and I hope it makes you laugh too. Who would win the Hallverse five, six, seven, eight dance dance off? Oh God! I mean, so I always kind of um, uh, I, I I always tend to cheat at these because um, uh, but because I've got some characters who just blatantly cheat. Um, uh, yeah, Shahrazad would use magic. Um, <laughs> Park would use magic. Um. Puck wouldn't participate. Puck isn't interested in mortal com in mortal competitions. Um, I think it would probably have to. I like it would probably have to be someone from the Spires era, because they're the ones who are of the right. I, I, it would have to be Darian, surely. It would have to be Darian. Oh yeah. 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 Right answer. Yeah. Oh my God! I'm so full of joy right now. Um. Okay. Here it nope. Hang on. It's not what I meant. Okay. 
Here is one from Callie. What is your favorite pierogi filling? Um, I I tend to agree that you kind of can't go wrong with just you know straight cheese and potato. To be honest, although that Christmas one sounds really fascinating. It does sound good. Um, okay, let me see here. Okay, here's one from Julia. The spies, the Spires world is so distinctive, not just in terms of the characters, but tonally. Uh, what has the experience been like of getting back into the headspace of those stories again? I, it's it's been really interesting. It's kind of simultaneously had quite a strong like um, coming home feeling, while also being a bit like it's sort of this odd like it's I suppose it's, I, I, it's one of those like I don't want to say nostalgic because that seems that has like negative connotation, but at the same time, obviously. In some ways, it's the word that is closest to the feeling of going back to a thing from a long time ago. Um, like it's it's been quite strange because it is quite totally different from a lot of the things I've worked on recently. Um, but it is, um, but it's um, but yeah, it's 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 been a little bit of a head fuck, but in kind of it's positive because I think. Positive head fuck is possibly the um uh, the the the, the soundbites way of putting it. Perfect. Um, here's one from Annaline. When you write characters, mm -hmm. Annaline has trouble. Let me phrase again. Annaline has trouble letting go of your characters mm -hmm. when Annaline finishes a book. Uh same. Do you let go of them when you're done, or do you feel like? For lack of a better term, they're always with you. I sort of a little from column A, a little from column B. Like I, I try because I try not. To, I, try, I try to have a very demystified approach to writing, so I am right. very conscious that you know my characters are. <laughs> yeah, you know, they're not real people. They are things I've invented. I control their actions. Um, mostly I, when I get to the end, generally when I get to the end of someone's story, obviously not always, so I'll see F. Edwin, um, I've got to the end of the story and that's kind of, they're in a place where I am pretty comfortable walking away from them. I'm very conscious that to a lot of my readers, that's not so much the case, but then that's partly because obviously I have context my readers don't have. Uh, mm, I think, especially with protagonists, I'm usually pretty comfortable walking away because, I mean, unless they're people who are going to get a sequel. Um, uh, when it's supporting characters who might go to spin off, they're more more inclined to live in my head rent free. But if I've done my job, I think I've made a reasonable case for the protagonist's story being kind of, at the very least, being in a place where it's okay to part ways. Absolutely, I I agree with that. I but but so many of your characters, st like, are still in my headspace and will probably be in my headspace for perpetuity. Oh, thank you. What would Oliver do is a frequent thing I consider. <laughs> All right, friends, we are moving to spoiler zone. Spoiler zone is fast approaching. Fast approaching is spoiler zone. If you don't want to hear spoilers, this is the time to click the little red leave button in the lower right hand of your screen. Okay, I see three people, four people, five, set. Okay, people are leaving. <laughs> Spoiler but, zone is starting. Good, 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 goodbye, if you've already left. Goodbye. It's Love been that. really great to have you. Spoiler zone is starting. Okay, friends, if you have spoilery questions, put them into Q&A. I have some spoiler questions. Oh, um, I'm, uh, someone's asking spoilers for Waiting for the Flood or for other books. I am just saying, I'm just saying, I mean, I guess it could be any book. So if you have any spoilery questions, fine. But we're going to stay mostly here with this yep. glorious book that just released on Tuesday. Because I love this book. All right. Here we go. I'm going to kick it off with a question from, I saw it and now it disappeared, from Sarah. If you had Marius's parents, would you find them sweet or infuriating, lol? Oh, God. Um. Oh, infuriating! Like if, if they were my parents, I'd find them infuriating. I think every, I think, I think those are the, exactly the kind of parents who you cannot appreciate from from saying you can't appreciate from the inside sounds 
gross if taken literally but um but you cannot appreciate parents like that if they're your parents you just can't fair but i can like as a parent i can totally see why they did what they did oh yeah i think in book like i think in book clubs that is going to be a fascinating discussion Mm -hmm. um because where the like should they have barged on the boat? I mean, I, I was into, I, was, I don't think I was particularly intending that to be a like a major moral question. Like I think like I think it's sort of like I think it's it's obviously a little it's obviously a little bit intrusive, but clear I think to, I think from an outside perspective, I think it clearly came from a positive place. Right. From a, a obviously from a an actual they your parents perspective obviously it's kind of oh yes yeah i i agree and i will i will say like for the love of all that's holy marius text your mother (laughs) but obviously there's nuance there's complication there's a lot of internal debate i understand all of it and i will say when i read that scene the first time i was just howling (laughs) howling with laughter his mother is and she's you know and and here's i mean this is me not the rest of all y'all is the person acting out of love or is the person acting out of spite yeah she's acting out of love i mean your description of her coat (laughs) It's just, oh, okay. So now I'm going to get to my comments on spoiler discussion. First of all, the annotations. I love an annotation almost as much as I love ephemera or an epistolary (laughs) novel. So it is like so high up there. And like the joy I had between like paragraph begins with, okay, now I got to go find it. Here's the, okay. And going back and forth. (laughs) Oh my, like. So, like, do you see how I am clutching? This I'm, I'm glad time? you enjoyed the process because I'm aware it's a bit fiddly sometimes. But I, but I loved it. It was such, and again, that's like a fourth way to read the book. Mm-hmm. It's a so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, one of the things that you talk about in the annotations, but also in your foreword, uh, harkens back to something we discussed last time. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you talk about uh, the time that you have with someone you move away from isn't wasted or lost, nor does it lessen or diminish the time you have with others after them. Yes. Which goes back to, I'm going to read it for all y'all again, Mm -hmm. Brian Washington from Memorial. Loving a person means letting them change when they need to and letting them go when they need to. And that doesn't make them any less of a home. Just maybe not one for you. I'm going to do it again or only for a season or two, but that doesn't diminish the love. It just changes the form. Exactly. And when Marius and Edwin were having that conversation, Mm -hmm. all I could think of was how adroitly you made that point. Oh, thank you so much. It just, okay, look. Kathy cried. Oh, it's okay. Um, I mean, oh God, you're. No, nope, no, nope, we're though? not bringing that up. Okay, good. Right, we're not. Okay, so <laughs> here from Joy, reading Wendy for the Flood, it is very easy to hate Marius for how much he hurt Edwin. Mm-hmm. In Chasing the Light, you manage to portray Marius as well, still rather awful, but also sympathetic. Did your understanding of Marius evolve from when you originally wrote Waiting the Waiting for the Flood to when you wrote Chasing the Light? Or did you always have this understanding of Marius as a complicated character? Um, it was always so. Uh, I I am very conscious that um, uh, like authors always say they plan stuff from the beginning. Um, and and I, my instinct is always to call bullshit. Um, uh, maybe, maybe that's just me. Uh, but no, genuinely, um, uh, it, it was always my intent. I did, also I, I have receipts on this because there is a reference to Marius having bad night vision in waiting that is foreshadowing. Yep. Yep. Um, part of it is that actually, um, again, I don't like to be. This sound comes across as incredibly self I apologize. I like, I like to think that I see all my characters as complicated. Um, except, I mean, obviously, like, 
barring for the ones that are like you know ontologically evil supernatural beings or child abusers um but um no but... you, all of your characters all of your characters have depth yeah thank you um so and, and okay so marius so I, so I mean, and in some ways it comes back to what you, the, 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 you know, the the lovely quote you just read out, which is that um, the entire intention behind the book was to write about someone, and ultimately two people who had been in a relationship that had ended in a way that didn't abnegate. It's not got the value of that. Maybe it might not be the right word. Um, the the value of that ended relationship um i think partly because uh, i sometimes it's it's um uh, like people get into knots about like definitions of genres and my my soft definition of any genre of fiction is that uh, uh, is that the book is within a genre if it's within dialogue with other books that are within that genre which i'm aware is circular but something that i often find doesn't sit great with me in romance is that there is sometimes a tendency and i think it's changing somewhat but um particularly at the time i uh first started work on on waiting there is almost sometimes a taboo against allowing people to have had positive meaningful relationships that aren't the relationship on the page um like like and again we're 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 I think we're coming out the era where like heroines are just not allowed to have had good sex before. Right. Um, yeah. Um, but, um, and so because I wanted it to be a relationship that had been good, but ended, I always had a actually pretty clear idea in my mind of what had been the dynamics and why it had ended and why, um, and the kind of person that Marius was and, where he was emotionally and what was going on. Um, I I even had a vague sense that it like his book would probably involve narrow boats, um, because that was something that I think I think because of the just because of um, I've 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 always kind of had a bit of a thing for narrow boats because every because it's that thing where like every so often you get things like oh it'd be cool to live in a narrow boat no it wouldn't um and there was a lot of the the imagery and the ideas that I knew would need to be brought across in um in Marius's story, I think fit well with the narrow boat thing. Um yeah, fair. And I I will say that I I think Marius is a complicated character, but I also mm -hmm. think almost all of your characters are complicated yeah. characters with I that. think all people are complicated people basically. They are. And yeah. I I never be, because from the beginning in Flood I mean Edwin was obviously grieving the loss of this relationship mm -hmm. but sometimes that happens narrow and... boats sorry <laughs> I think just... yeah so I'm and sorry I... and, and life is complicated and and messy mm -hmm. and Marius is complicated and messy Flagrantly yeah. so. Um, I will say in aftermath, what Adam and Edwin witness when they're looking back down the hill is one of the greatest vignettes that I will hold in my brain. No, oh, thank you so much. I like what I can see him on the boat, off the boat, towards mm -hmm. church, away from church, back yeah. the other way, back on the boat. Oh no! Should I? You know, I just. Oh my gosh! I, like it's and 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 that also is so lovely and gives me so much hope for him. Uh huh. Um. So anyway, that's my rambling on Marius. So here, this is interesting from Melanie. She says, "I know, I know, death of the author, lol," as Clementine would say. <laughs> How worried should we be about Marius's obvious eating disorder, notwithstanding the fact that he had added some muscle by the end? Uh, so yeah, death of the author. Um, so I, um, I suppose the answer to that, so, I mean, ultimately it's, the, the, how, by how worried should you be, how worried should you be in general? Like I don't, um, so the, so the death of the author answer is that, um, it's kind of up to you. How do you respond to the text? Um, 
the broader answer this is going to stray into you know discussion of a complex real world issue and if you're not here for that just be aware um i suppose it kind of depends on how you feel you should respond to someone with an eating disorder anyway so i think one of the obviously um i am not the kind of person who believes that love magically fixes things it's certainly not my intent that marius is fixed by aftermath because that's not how it works um but i do something that so part of the reason that um that marius has an obvious eating disorder that's kind of not centralized i think i was talking talk, talk right at the top of the thing that we had the question about like uh, dealing with social issues without centralizing them um for me it's really important to occasionally include things like that as just kind of a thing that's not the main focus of the book or the main focus of the character's arc because i think it's um i think it can be stigmatizing uh to always treat that kind of issue like it's the most important thing in the world um and like when people engage in self-destructive behaviors whatever those self-destructive behaviors are um i kind of don't think that, i very seldom think that the right thing to do is to make a big thing out of it especially if you're not a professional especially like if you oh, i mean obviously it's complex it depends on what your relationship with the person is that's the other thing is that like kind of you know how worried you should be about marius like i mean the, the glib answers are well you don't know him so it's not really any of your business um or, or, sorry that's um uh, or alternatively um uh, well worrying won't help um if you see what i mean like it's um yeah there's actually kind of a uh a, a quite a it's 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 sort of almost deliberately there to be a to be a question without an answer because it's not like um it's not um people people have issues and caring about someone who's got issues is complex and it, it, I, it I think is... go ahead. I was going to say, I, 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 I was going to go on a, I was going to go on a tangent about Ted Lasso, but I'm a go 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 go. Oh, I'm sorry. So, um, very semi-famously, there's a scene in Ted Lasso where he quotes Walt Whitman as saying, "Be curious, not judgmental." Um, that's not a Walt Whitman quote. I know. It's uh, do you know what it's do you know what it's from? No, what's it from? Okay, according to according to my very brief internet googling, according to people that like look up quotes and things. Um, the earliest reference anyone can find is actually from a um uh, an agony aunt column in I think like the seventies about finding your daughter's contraceptives, and when you think about it, really good advice if you found your daughter's contraceptives. And actually, from a certain point of view, be curious. I, th I think I think the answer is to how how worried should we be about Marius's eating disorder is you, you should be curious not judgmental and maybe curious isn't the right word like you know, I don't ask for a bunch of questions about their eating disorder but like I think the important thing is you should be non-judgmental and, and it doesn't define them exactly it doesn't define him um okay by the way first Ted Lasso reference in eight events my life is complete fantastic <laughs> <laughs> It really is. I feel like I didn't actually watch it until like last year. Um, well, at least you got to watch it all at once that way. <laughs> How many times have I rewatched it? Nine bajillion. Um, so we're wrapping up soon. I just have to tell you th other things that I love. Again, and I say this every event, the nuance and perspective that you bring to every single character is a true gift to us because it reminds us to quote Ted Lasso. <laughs> to be curious, not judgmental. So maybe you should start claiming that quote. Um, <laughs> I I like it being attributed to an anonymous agony in the seventies. I I actually I... love that because it, but it's a great way to move through life. Mm -hmm. Makes things a lot easier. Um, one thing that I do have to shout out that you did was the different the 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 passive aggressiveness between Marius and Adam. Mm -hmm. Oh my God! The first time I read the digital review copy i was like there are typos in here and i was like oh no i see what you're doing <laughs> i i will admit actually when i was looking when i was going through copy editing i was looking at going people at people are going i think this is a typo i'm going to get letters from people saying um you've forgotten that in the first story 
Yep. Um, <laughs> but it's so fun when you figure it out. And and my personal favorite is Aida. <laughs> um, and then the way Adam gives right back mm -hmm. with the elderflower wine. Uh huh. So I know what elderflower cordial tastes like, but like, what does elderflower wine taste like? I mean, quite often it tastes like piss. Is it? <laughs> is it just you... because it's badly made, or because that's what elderflower wine tastes like? I th it's. I think it's hard to make well. Is the thing. Okay. Um, so it's. I think also there's kind of a. It might be a really British thing that people making bad home be, people doing bad homebrew is kind of a kind of a, a cultural joke in okay. England, and I think particularly in, I, I, my guess is in America you more like to do it with beers. Yes. Whereas I think there's a certain type of person that specifically tries to make slightly quirky sort of herbal wines. Um, like, oh, I mean, if you really want to go back to it, like it was a running joke in the, um, uh, in the 70s to 80s British sitcom, The Fall and Rise of Reginald Perry with Leonard Rossiter, um, which, let's be clear, that's a 73 year sitcom. That's not going to have aged brilliantly, but like it is, it's a, um, uh, like it, okay. it's, it's quite a deep seated cultural thing. But I, I, like, and, and in the audio with you, ha when you have Edwin reading it, and Adam offering comments, and then at the end, when he says, mm -hmm. "If it tastes like piss, don't drink it," and you, and Edward just wails. It was just one time. <laughs> anyway, my friend, what a joy! Thank you so much for having me. As always, it's just it's... I can't like this. Just fuels me for so long, and I'm so grateful for your work, and I'm so grateful to everybody who has tuned in and supported the store by ordering books not just alexis's books jen by the way jennifer g redheaded jennifer says to say hello to everybody because she now has close personal re relationships with half of you because of your emails back and forth <laughs> um so we're very very grateful um like i said i will get an email out to everyone who registered um with the brian washington quote and all the cultural references and all the links probably by monday because i'm going to take some time off um, but I appreciate everybody, uh, Alexis and team, y'all are the best. I hope you have a great evening and I'll look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Take care. Bye everybody. Bye.